Well, good morning, everyone, and a huge welcome to this year's Social Work Week. We were so thrilled with the response to the first Social Work Week of its kind last year that we decided we would do it all again this year. And once again, we've been blown away by the response and the number of you who've given up your valuable time to be with us this morning and throughout the week. Apologies again for the slight hiccup with the link, but if that's the worst that happens throughout the week, we'll all be very relieved. I hope you will find the week inspiring, moving, engaging, and above all, that you'll leave with an even greater sense of pride in social work as a profession, the work that we do and the impact that we have. I hope you find the event throughout the week inspiring, moving and engaging, and that you will leave with a greater sense of pride in social work as a profession, the work that we do and the impact that we have. And it feels so important that you know, through the difficult times in the pandemic and more recently with the war in Ukraine, as well as the other conflicts taking place around the world, we are once again reminded of the hugely important role that social work plays in society and the impact social workers have on millions of people's lives. It feels important to grasp this opportunity to come together, to reflect, be challenged in our thinking and practice, to learn and to simply take some time out from the normal routine. This year for Social Work Week, we have done things slightly differently. As an organisation, our commitment has always been to co-production, dialogue and engagement. So with this in mind, we've given greater ownership of this important week to the sector and those with lived experience, with a number of independent events running, which we are really excited about. We hope you will sign up for these and enjoy this new format. And it's great that almost 5,000 of you are joining us already for today and the week ahead. As with last year, we have an illustrator attending many of our events, including this one. So I'm delighted to introduce Carrie Lewis from New Possibilities and to see the visual minutes and graphic record of the discussion, which we know had such an impact last year. We have three key themes this year across the week, which will be reflected through the different sessions. What social work means to me, views from lived and learned experience with the professional standards at the core, reflections on the last year and what's next for social work, and celebrating World Social Work Day tomorrow, co-building a new eco-social world and leaving no one behind. For us, this means having the voice of people with lived experience central to the week, setting the tone of our focus on protection of the public. We want to facilitate conversations about raising standards in social work throughout the week, promoting professional identity and building confidence in the profession. We wanted to encourage the sector to contribute to the week and deliver the independent events I mentioned aligned with our core programme and themes. And we wanted to enable conversations and collaborate with those with an interest in social work around our strategic ambitions. It's been a busy year for us as the social work regulator since we last met at Social Work Week 2021. We are moving from our setup phase into planning mode for some of the changes that we'd like to see happening across social work in England. Changes that in some cases are long overdue and will bring further improvement to social work as a profession and how it's practised. We are looking forward to starting some of those discussions with you this week and working with you beyond it on making this happen. I hope you've had the opportunity to see, read and engage with some of the things we've done throughout the year. Our CPD consultation, the publication of our Social Work in England Emerging Themes report, our education and training research, our AMP research report and our EDI action plan and anti-racism survey. There is a lot more than that, but that's just the start. And this is just the start of our week. I can't think of a better way to open the second Social Work Week of its kind than by focusing on co-production. Our opening session is called Co-Production, It's Everyone's Business, because it literally is everyone's business, and it's certainly at the heart of ours. So I'm absolutely delighted now to hand over to Mr Jack Harrison, our participation officer, who's going to talk to you about our wonderful National Advisory Forum. You will then hear from some of its members, Ashley Searle and Isaac Samuels, and from two of our board members, A.D. Cooper and Sue Ross, before we finish with a short Mentimeter quiz, which will get you involved in the discussion. So enough from me. Enjoy the week. And Jack, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Yeah, so my name is Jack Harrison. I'm the participation officer at Social Work England. Um, I lead on core production and, and manage the National Advisory Forum. So just for a few minutes at the beginning of this session today, um, I'll spend a little bit of time introducing the National Advisory Forum and, and the work of it as well. 
Um, so as Sarah said, um, very early on, we set out an ambition um, as an organisation uh, to co-produce our work. Um, so at the beginning of 2020, the National Advisory Forum um, was the group that we set up to to really put that into practice and, and to drive that forward across the organisation. Um, as you can see there, so it's it's made up of um, a representative group um, across the sector. So there's practising social workers, there's social work students, there's people with lived experience of social work um, and social work education and training providers. Um, and we often use the terms lived and learned experience of social work um, that people can get either by receiving services or by by practising and learning about it that way. Um, and we try have a an equity in knowledge is the term that we use um, across both those two things where they're equally as valuable and bring different aspects um, of knowledge and experience to the work. Um, you can move on to the next slide, Philippa. Um, so this one just briefly outlining some of the some of the roles um, that we've that we've given to the National Advisory Forum. Um, part of that is bringing challenge to us as an organisation, both in terms of what we do and, and how we do it. Um, and, th and that's a broad remit um, on top of some of the other points on the slide there. Um, and uh, one, one aspect of this is being let us, letting members tell us how they would like to fulfill that role and kind of making that role their own and um, yeah, bringing themselves to it. So it's although we try to set out the forum on a on a particular path, um, it's very much been a collaborative approach um, and not necessarily one that um, that we've driven ourselves, which has been um, a pleasure for me to, to be part to see what that's become. Um, on the next slide, Philippa. So our journey, so we first recruited in March 2020. Um, so the first week of lockdown was the first time we recruited. So half of that was in person, half of that was um, virtual, just by the way of um, when that lockdown started. Uh, we then recruited on October 2020 and November 21. So we're now at a full group of 18, um, which we've capped. So I guess over that first year, the group was forming, was establishing relationships, uh, working out ways of working, and also, I guess, figuring out what core production looked like in our organisational setting and, and what the role of the forum would look like in, in making that happen. Over that time, so there's been over 60 different work streams all across um, a broad range of the organisation that we've been able to co-produce, which is a number that as, as a group we're really, uh, really proud of. Um, towards the end of last year, we also evaluated our first year, uh, which was a large undertaking that resulted in a report and um, that went all the way up to our executive leadership team and the board. Um, and over, over the last number of months, we've, we've been working on the recommendations that came out of that report um, and have been implementing them and putting those into practice. Um, oh, what's next? Um, I aptly named um, the title of, of, of this core production, it's everyone's business. Um, that's still an aspiration that we're working to across the organisation of really embedding it embedded core production as a way of working in, in all aspects of, of what we do. Um, so over the next business year, we're delivering core production training to the whole organisation. Um, and that's that's training that we've we've core produced um, and we've made it bespoke to our organisation. Um, so that's that's kind of the next step. Um, next slide, Philippa. So I'll also um, introduce some of our members. Um, so there you, you can see them on the screen and actually and Isaac are with us today and you might see other people's faces um, across the week as people are involved in, in other sessions of, of Social Work Week. Um, but yeah, I would just like to take this moment, I guess, to acknowledge the, the time, the commitment and the energy that each and every single person um, has put into this organisation and into the National Advisory Forum and, and really making it what it is. So um, yeah, a sincere thank you to each person who goes above and beyond really um, above their personal lives and above their working lives um, and has really made made this work in the way that it has. So um, yeah, we're very grateful. And then the next slide, Philippa. So anyone who's seen a presentation on co-production will be will be familiar with with the ladder. I'm sure it's um, but it's one of those for me that's it's a it's a classic for a reason. Um, and so it shows core production and core design right at the, at the top of that ladder where that's the aspiration to get to. So working in an equal and reciprocal reciprocal partnership with people, um, yeah, is, is is where we want to be and, and, and is the ideal to work towards. I guess as a as a regulator, we have a unique 
relationship with that ladder as we have we have statutory functions we have an engagement team of which i'm part of we often consult and we do a lot of informing for to the sector and to the social workers on our register so there's aspects of our work that require us to do to be at certain points of that ladder but i guess one of the things that we've taken away from that is there's some things that we can't change that we have to do but we can change the way that we do it and we can change the way that that feels and we can change the way that we involve people in and make that work as well as it can for the people that we deliver that to. Um, there's a quote from there from Sally, which, which I'll let you read, um, which, which sums it up really well. Um, and is again something that we, we work towards to try and, and get right. There um, and, and so that is that's my quick little intro wrapped up. So um, on the next slide, Philippa. Um, and I get to hand over to Isaac, um, who's a member of our National Advisory Forum, who has been since um, since its inception and who I've learned a great deal from. Um, so over to Isaac. Thank you, Jack, and um, welcome. Good morning, everybody. So my name is Isaac Samuels and I live in East London with my husband. I have four dogs. Um, I get to do this really interesting thing called co-production. So what does co-production mean to me? Co-production means the world to me. It's it's not just a word, it's a way of being. So in 1995, when my mum um, passed away, I ended up needing the support of a social worker. I ended up accessing services. And since 1995, I have had in many, many, many times, I've had social workers at these big milestones. So when I had my first breakdown and I spent Need it nine months in hospital, social workers were really present. When I was diagnosed with HIV, social workers were really present. When I started my recovery journey, social workers were really present. So co-production for me is fundamental um, way of supporting people like myself, having a voice. Um, for far too long, I felt like I didn't have a voice and I wasn't able to do the things that most of us take for granted. So for me, a good life is actually being able to work, having a loving relationship, having a home, having good friends. But I would say that for a long time, for about 10 years of my journey, that wasn't achievable because I wasn't doing co-production. I've had some great social workers along the way that have enabled me to see, even when I've not been able to see my potential. So co-production at its heart is where people can come together as equals and really create the solutions that matter to people like me. So it's not about people making decisions about other people's lives. It's about coming together, working collaboratively. And I know you social workers do this every day um, and are great at it. Um, it's about helping people in their most difficult moments, future, overcoming the barriers that they face. So what do I bring to Social Work England and co-production? So I obviously bring my own experiences of accessing services for the last 25 years. But the thing that I think I bring most of all is my hope for co-production to be a reality for everybody. Without co-production, we'll never have a world where people are able to live their full potentials. Social workers are able to support people to overcome any barrier that they may face. I often talk about it's not a good day when you have a social worker in your life, but actually it can be a brilliant day when you have a social worker in your life that understands the value of co-production. It's not about creating services, it's about a life with meaning and purpose. Social workers have supported me not only at those really terrible, difficult moments to think beyond what was happening in that, in that immediate, but actually think about a future worth living. So I've had great social workers that have enabled me to do that. And what they did was really, really simple, but not everybody gets gay production. They really took time to understand me. They really helped me create a future that was based on not only what was important to me, what was important to people around me. They helped me see in my darkest moments and some of those moments were really, really dark. I spent a long time in and out of hospital because of my mental health challenges. But a few social workers helped me not only find a new life after my mental health breakdown, but helped me realise that through co-production, I could actually do something to support other people. 
Co-production has been one of the things that has enabled me not only to share my story, and at times my story is, is difficult and full of lots of problems, but at times it's full of lots of hopes, dreams and aspirations. Co-production is, for me, the biggest recovery tool that you could ever use for people like me. I've been able to not only move from the position of not doing anything to actually working as a national advisor around co-production, it's so important. I think the next part of my journey is gonna be even more important because more and more there is a need for people to understand the value of co-production. Working together collaboratively is so important. It's important because people need support to achieve those really basic things. And at the beginning, I talked about having a home, having dogs, having a partner. I never thought that was achievable. But over the years, through sharing my experience and people really understanding and keeping me at the heart of every decision, which is co-production, um, that has been possible. So I got married last year. The future looks hopeful. And I love the fact that co-production is going to be part of my future because actually co-production has given me so, so much. But I know that co-production could give so many other people the same life that I've had. So that's me. Um, I would say Social Work England is really invested in co-production and I'd like to thank everybody from those that have supported and facilitated it to actually my members of the NAF that bring all of their experiences and that's lived experiences, learned experiences and together when we share our experiences we can really help systems, particularly a regulatory system service, really work for people and it's about good lives. Um, I'm going to invite Ashley to come and um, introduce herself. Hello, good morning everyone. Thank you, Isaac. Uh, my name is Ashley Sell. I am a National Advisory Forum member. Um, I am also a care leaver. Uh, as well as being a care leaver, I work in children's services, in service improvement, commissioning um, and supporting anywhere that they're struggling with service innovation um, might be Ofsted so I'm a little bit of a jack of all trades. Um, in terms of what co-production means to me I remember having come into social care at quite a young age um, and having a feeling that things were being done to me instead of with me um, I felt very out of control of what was happening, the decisions that were being made, why they were being made. Um, and I remember having a look at the time um, and thinking, I have all of these ideas about how we can work together, how my experiences can help make things better for services or for other people or how sharing all of that information between us we can start coming up with some solutions for how we can work better with the people we work for, but also how they can help us do best by them. Um, and in terms of co-production, I think what's so important about co-production is understanding the difference between engagement and co-production. Um, and a lot of times people can think, I've done a survey, I've co-produced. And it's very different. So when we're doing things like surveys um, or standalone working groups, we're not having people involved in the life cycle of developing something with us. We're having it at that start point and we might not remember to go back and check in and have that continuous development cycle with them. So I think coming from being looked after having lots of placement moves. I remember between the ages of 15 and 17, I moved uh, about 13 times. I couldn't settle into placements. I had um, ooh, five or six different social workers in the space of that time as well, a lot of change. Um, and having all of those experience, I don't think is a negative in the sense of co-production. I think it's given me so much to be able to give back and share and help. And in social work, we work with so many people that it's never possible to hear everyone's journey. 
and we're never going to be able to be an expert in everyone's experience. But I think when we do really good co-production and really meaningful co-production, we start bringing in all of those elements of that experience and seeing what things look like in practice. And I think we all know in social work, there's a lot of ways that we record information that don't tell the story of the people we're supporting. So it might say that 90% of our children are in suitable accommodation and we would tick that off as we've hit that milestone, we're hitting what we need. But until we hear the stories of what that looks like for people, we don't understand what it looks like in practice and we don't truly understand what we can do to improve it or if it's already working really, really well, and we, we need to hear that as well, that experience. So I think in terms of what I bring to Social Work England, um, I think having been in children's services, having such a variety of experiences across mental health, children's social care, um, semi-independence, and now coming into a position of working in children's services and understanding where co-production fits or isn't fitting at the moment and can fit, I think is really, really important. Um, in terms of the co-production journey of where I'm going next, Social Work England, I definitely think are leading the way in terms of co-production and I think it's so exciting getting to have this session with you all today and speak a little bit about it. But I think where I'm going next is supporting Social Work England and supporting all of you where we can to make sure that co-production is at the heart of everything we do and that can sound like something very easy to say and maybe not so easy to put into practice. But I think what we're really, really hoping that you get from today's session and all of our continued work with you all is to understand how you do embed it in your practice, how you do it meaningfully and how you continue to make sure that you do hear those voices. And it isn't one voice in isolation. Co-production is about working with a range of people to understand how it affects all of them or how their needs differ in terms of one element or one bit of social work. And when we co-produce, it means that we get all of that input as well. Um, and I'm really, really strong on not having tokenistic co-production, co making sure you have a goal for it, making sure you understand what the purpose of you doing it is and what you hope to achieve. So I hope that's been helpful to hear from me. I'm going to hand over to AD, who's going to give us some more information. Thank you. So I'm AD Cooper. Um, I'm recently joined the Board of Social Work England as a trustee, and I am a registered social worker, and I'm really pleased and a bit scared about being here this morning um, because this is a bit new to me in this, uh, in this role. I've been doing it since uh, last October. Um, so uh, we were asked to talk about what co-production means to us and co-production for me, it means lots of different things. Um, I want to talk about the aspect of co-production that recognises three of the key principles around recognising people as assets, building on people's capabilities and facilitating rather than delivering and about how we do this as, as social workers. Um, why is it important to me? Because for me, it goes back to my core principles and values as a social worker. I've chosen to talk about safeguarding adults because I've been involved in something called making safeguarding personal for over 10 years now. And I think it's really important to continue talking about this, even though it's been incorporated into the CARE Act, because I don't think it's always an approach that's followed by everyone. And in fact, we know from the impact of COVID, on practice in terms of safeguarding adults that it's been more difficult to achieve, partly because of the reduction in face-to-face -face contact, um, but also because of additional work pressures over the last couple of years. I've been party to some reports, insight reports, that really um, show how uh, safeguarding activity has impacted, been impacted by the pandemic. But if I think back to 10 years ago and why I started getting involved in changing the culture and practice of safeguarding, it was because it was very process driven. It was looking at what was substan what was called substantiating whether abuse had taken place and not really considering what the person who's at the center of this wanted. 
and we knew that people weren't being involved in the safeguarding processes, sometimes didn't even know it was going on about them. And at that time, there was a huge change in adult social care and personalization was driving a really different approach to the care management approach that had dominated in the 1990s, but safeguarding practice seemed unaffected by it. So when I say we, at that time, I was assistant director, director of adult social services, and leading for the Association of Directors of Adult Social Services on Safeguarding and working with colleagues across a lot of different councils who wanted to really change the way we undertook safeguarding practice. Um, we piloted, tested, wrote up what we were doing, produced toolkits. There are now three iterations of the toolkits, case studies about what we thought good practice in safeguarding was about and a lot of mature materials that tried to support colleagues to adopt and making safeguarding personal approach to practice. And the key principles of making safeguarding personal are about working in a way that's outcome focused, person centered and achieves choice and control. So it's aimed at achieving not just safety, but also better well-being for the person who's involved. It was incorporated into the CARE Act guidance and that was kind of fortuitous and amazing because at the time we were doing it as good practice, but it then became statutory. So what does it mean? It echoes some of the things that Isaac and Ashley have been talking about. It's a strength-based approach to safeguarding. It's looking at how we help people keep themselves safe, building on what they can do rather than they can't do. It means that safeguarding is not done to people, it's done with people. Ashley mentioned that whole feeling of, of, of being done to rather than done with. It means that we involve people at the start, ask them what they want to happen from the process, uh, and that's what we help them to achieve. We make sure they continue to be involved. We check that what we're doing is what they want us to do, as Isaac described, and it's a really different way of working with people to the way in which we worked in safeguarding before. So for me, making safeguarding personal is really um, about trying to achieve a co-production approach in direct practice with people who are often at the most difficult and painful and um, traumatic uh, times in their lives. So how am I going to um, champion co-production moving forward? I've given you an example of what I continue to do, which is talk about, write about, teach and train on, on making safeguarding personal. Whenever anybody asks me, I try and help um, inspire people to work in a different way, social workers to work in a different way uh, when they're dealing with safeguarding um, work. I have a lot of different types of roles in the role that I have now got with Social Work England. For me, it's about working with the National Advisory Forum at events like today and in other ways to promote all the different ways that Social Work England is trying to integrate co-production into its way of working. So I hope that um, I'll continue to do that. The um, job is for three years, so I've got another couple of years to work on this. Um, and with Sue, who I'm gonna hand over to, who joined Social Work England at the same time, uh, we feel both of us really strongly that as members of the board, we can both model and support co-production within Social Work England in a positive way and as social workers, as members of the board. So Sue, I'm gonna hand over to you. Hopefully you have better luck with your technology. <laughs> I'm not so confident, Aidy, but I'll try. Thank you very much. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Sue Ross, um, and like Aidy, I joined the board um, fairly recently. Um, I, I've been asked to, to talk about these two questions, what co-production means to me and how will I champion it? And probably more importantly, how, how will we champion it together? So Aidy's talked about co-production in social care with adults, um, particularly in safeguarding and, and, and the huge impact of making safeguarding personal, the huge challenge around that. Um, and that's a commitment we both share and work for in our professional lives as social workers. Um, but I'm going to talk about um, co-production in children's services briefly. And, and let me emphasize, I think exactly the same values that apply in adult work um, apply in, in terms of children's too. The methods and approaches that, uh, that, that we use for co-production need to adapt to those challenges in children and services work, but um, they're, they're equally uh, significant. Co-production is rooted in the principles, as we've heard, that we work with families, children and young people to find shared solutions. And 
I think this has really been developing to since way back in the 1990s, but particularly more um, in, in, the, in the past 10 to 15 years, as the concepts of co-production have really been coming on. And if you haven't seen um, the work uh, done by the Social Care Institute for Excellent Sky, uh, back in 2017, uh, I strongly urge you to have a look at it. They've done some really good publications around co-production in children's services. And similarly, Action for Children, who produced a guide to uh, co-producing children's services um, with some great examples uh, in, uh, from them uh, around co-produced services for young people in education and in special schools. Both Sky and Action for Children stress that co-production is less about identifying and focusing and responding to a child's needs and the problems they have in favour of a strengths-based reciprocal approach based on a child's best interests, knowledge, experience, skills and support networks. It is rooted in an understanding of the child and young person and their family and their lived experience, which we've heard about so much today from Isaac and from Ashley. This is really difficult for us to do. I appreciate that entirely, particularly with the huge demands of welfare in children's services and the high levels of public concern and about risk. But I'm going to talk briefly about just two ways I think co-production makes a real difference. I could have come up with other examples and I know that out there there are some brilliant examples which I hope we will get chance to reflect on a little bit today. So two ways I think um, co-production in children's services really makes a difference and I've seen it for myself. First of all in developing resources and plans and programmes and creating structures to enable co-production. Um, what I'm referring to here is the development in um, structures in all sorts of different ways which really influence the way services are developed and taken forward. And I'm thinking about things like youth councils, um, youth parliaments, young people's mayors, children in care councils, hugely um, important in terms of the, the whole planning for uh, children in care. And they're well established in most parts of the country, but not all. And these are really important. And I'm seeing some really exciting developments by people like housing associations setting up youth forums to enable them to work with young people to provide the kind of accommodation that young people really need. I've seen some really fantastic work by young asylum seekers um, really influencing the way services provided for them are, 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 are developed so that they really fit their needs and hopes for a better life through co-production. These examples are out there and they are growing and we must, um, we, we must do everything we can to encourage. The second area is in the area of workforce. And I would say that having the right children's social workers and managers means having a workforce that are really committed to working with young people and their families. And to do that, we must continually assess and ensure they are able to do that. So this means that when we select, when we recruit social workers, when we promote them, when we um, assess them in terms of their continuing professional development, when we bring people onto the boards of, of providers, um, we need to test all the time through the involvement of young people that we have the right people who actually understand the lived experience and have some commitment to the lived experience of people who use our services. And, and, and I'm happy to say that Social England um, involved the uh, National Advisory Forum on uh, AD and, and my appointment. And it's clear um, the, the as even as a regulator, um, with all the statutory duties that uh, Social England have, um, that, that that commitment is uh, at, absolutely fundamental. So when we approach staff, when we work on our continuing professional development, we must find the ways to have feedback from children and young people and their families about our effectiveness. And this is such a basic requirement and it does really make a difference. But too often it doesn't happen. Um, and I think it's a huge area that we need to uh, push for. So what does co-production uh, 
with young people mean to me? It means it's strengths based. It assumes young people and their families will change and grow. It values their lived experience and it sees their lived experience as a huge resource. It means sharing key decision making where it counts, whether, it whether it's about who we employ, how we work, where we work, etc. It's about listening to children and young people and their families about what matters to them, what they fear and what they hope for. As Sky says, it's not just a word. So how will I champion co-production? How will you champion co-production going forward? Well, for me, it has to be about listening to groups like the National Advisory Forum, being willing to talk a bit less and listen a bit more, hearing the authentic voice of young people and uh, children in all aspects of a children's social work and to give voice to that. I want to support my social work colleagues in every way possible by recognising and talking about their work they do to co-produce in some of what I regard as the most challenging areas of our work in these most challenging of times. Social Work England is giving voice to the importance of co-production, its work, as, and as a regulator, um, and you can keep it in the forefront of your work too. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. And, and as Sue uh, rightly said, co-production isn't just a word. So I wanted to share this slide with you and I hope you'll find this useful in your co-production journeys. So often organisations think about co-production as the tip of the iceberg. Um, but actually co-production, to, to do it well, you have to create the right conditions. So the stuff that you can't see beneath the waterline is so important. So if we think about people having good ordinary lives, how do we create the right conditions for co-production to happen? And it is about those values. So it's about being flexible, it's about building trust, it's about listening, it's about rewriting the rules, it's often about empathy, it's about the relationships, and it's about working in partnership. And I would just like to say, please do use this. This has uh, been co-produced and it really talks to what are the values that need to be in place for co-production to happen. And Social Work England have really, really created the space where we, we can co-produce based on these values. Um, creators of change, um, you'll find this and we'll share it after, but really do create the values to co-produce. Thank you. Thanks, Isaac. We're now going to take the opportunity to um, we'd like to involve you in the last last part of this session and we're going to do a Mentimeter. So for those of you that um, hopefully have access to the toolbar, you can you'd hopefully see at the top there's a little icon with um, that looks like this, which if you click on it will bring up the Mentimeter um, questions, which is an opportunity for us to have a bit more of an interactive and hear from you as a group of people that have joined us today. For those of you that may not have the Mentimeter um, at the top of your toolbar you can also access uh, Mentimeter by going to www.menti.com and it will ask you sub to submit a code and the code is 97361755. Um, Vicky's just put that in the chat so you can also um, link there. So I'm going to hand over to Ashley who's going to lead us through the Mentimeter um, questions. Thanks Ashley. Thanks, Philippa. So we're just going to give you all a moment to get on to Menti or to in your function at the top of your screen, like highlighted, have that open in the side of your teams. Our first question that we're asking you is what does co-production mean to you? Um, so you can put one or two words in there. Uh, and they will come up on the screen together. So we've already had 80 people contribute. We've got elements around equality, togetherness, working together, collaborating, listening, empowerment, partnerships. And these really are the elements that are important when we co-produce. It's, it's working with people, building those relationships, 
making sure that they're in the life cycle of co-production, that we're coming back. And I think one element that's always really, really important is letting people know what's changed because of that involvement and making them feel like somebody's put in there empowered about what their feedback has done um, and what it will continue to do. We're seeing loads of engagement from you all in feel so positively about co-production and how you can do that within your wider work. Um, and we have another question coming up for you as well, but I can still see you all typing away in this one. Unfortunately, the words have gone so small because there's so many, I'm going to struggle to read too many more out to you. But I think from, from what you can all see in their inclusion, it really is about making sure that you work with people and, and, and have them involved wherever they can be. So the next question that we have is, what two words would you use to describe the feelings you have when you co-produce? And we know that it's not possible for everybody to be an expert in co-production immediately. Sometimes it does take a bit of time and, and a bit of risk and a bit of uh, being vulnerable as well. So we've got happiness, dignified, rewarding, warm fuzzies. I like that one. Positive, proud, supportive, honest. Hopeful, empowering, empowerment, satisfaction, success. So when we co-produce, it really, really can leave you feeling renewed. It can make you feel like you've learned something. It can make you feel excited for what's about to come and what's coming in in the days ahead. And it can make you feel like you've built a really strong relationship with the people that you work with as well and understand some new perspectives. If we go on to the next one, Philippa. Thank you. So this one's a really important one from the conversation today that you've heard from all of us in this session. What one thing will you do differently as a result of today's event? So we've got listen more, try harder, professional challenge. Professional challenge is a good one. Sometimes when we think of co-production, it's easy to get caught into just what we do when we co-produce. But actually there's an element as well of how do we build that into the organisation? How do we build it into what we're surrounded? And I think Social Work England as the regulator setting such a standard and expectation for co-production is hopefully something that we can all take into our workplaces, into our professional environments and start to use. Active listening we have, communicate better, meaningful and that active listening is so important it's making sure that you really hear people and understand what they're saying um and sometimes when we listen to people's experiences or or stories about what they've been through it's easy to hear it in a sense but then we're not interpreting it we're not making it meaningful to us or understanding what we can do because of it consider forums in work, lots of brilliant ideas here and we will be sharing the slides as well after so I'm sure you'll be able to pick up on what some of the other colleagues in the room have said as well. Um, we have one last question for you which is any other thoughts or comments that you would like to share about co-production and my challenge to you would be to try and use a word that you haven't already used for one of the other answers. And you can do short sentences in this one as well of a couple of words. It doesn't have to be a one word answer. 
So it's essential validation, training, that there's more to think about, keep learning, power sharing, being more aware, always keeping it at the forefront of everything that you do, a modern concept, that it's meaningful, we should be humble, and it's a reminder of the social work values, that we can all contribute to the process, no matter our background. And I think that's a really, really, really powerful one there. Keep talking about it and keep it on the agenda in mind. It needs purpose and clarity to ensure it's meaningful. Too often management want co-production, but they don't want to listen or act on the outcomes. And I think uh, something that really, really helps with that barrier is when you know that who you've co-produced with, you'll be coming back to afterwards. It makes us more accountable for the co-production that we do. And we know that none of us want to take a part of somebody's story or experience and come back after three or four months and say, actually, nothing's changed. Things have carried on exactly the way they were, but thank you for sharing. So I think it's important to make sure that there's outputs and, and you give yourself that accountability of, how am I going to feed back what co-production has changed? And that's why we will always try and um, make sure that you're all aware of what we're doing as Social Work England um, and make sure that that is available for you through these events, on the websites, through the reading materials that we put out. So we've got be empathetic and understanding. You may not always agree with the people you work with, but this is what being a social worker is all about and adapting to needs. And that's the thing as well that we've learned in co-production that those different voices and different experiences are so important and just because one experience may be one way that doesn't invalidate or take away from another experience they're all a part of the bigger picture so just want to thank you all for engaging with us so well putting so many answers forward in the chat and i think even us co-production is a constant learning exercise and as much as we hope you've learned from us today we're also learning from you when we do these exercises as well and there's so many answers in there that are things for us to go away and think about too thanks ashley um it's just been really great to see so many people respond to the mentimeter and see some really great feedback and comments um, I'm going to hand over now to Sarah Blackmore, who's going to close today's session. Thanks, Ashley and Philippa. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, I can't believe that's it for our first session, everyone. Um, and I also cannot think of a better way to open the second Social Work Week of its kind than by talking about co-production and hearing from our speakers how life changing it can be when it's done properly. Not just life enhancing, but actually life changing. Um, and when it's done with real commitment. I think the Mentimeter responses indicate just the level of enthusiasm that social workers and people with lived experience have to work together in this way. Um, and I was particularly struck by uh, the comment that someone put that, that co-production is demanding and it requires um, emotion and empathy and insight. And actually it is, co-production's not easy. If it was easy, then everybody would be doing it. Um, but it it does require real intent. It requires real commitment um, on everyone's part and at all levels within and across organisations to make it happen. Um, thank you to our amazing speakers, Ashley and Isaac, for sharing your journeys and what it's meant to you, to Jack and to Aidy and Sue. Um, and I can, you know, it's great to see the commitment to co-production um, from the board at Social Work England and to helping us really work to embed it right the way across our organisation and our approach to regulation and to developing the social work profession. And thank you to you all. There was 300 of you here today for helping us get this week off to a great start. Please do go away and think about what co-production means to you and the changes that you can make within your own own practice and organisation, regardless of your role, to be a co-production champion. We look forward to seeing you at some of our other events throughout the week. Thank you very much. 
Thanks, Sarah. And I'm just mindful we've finished a little bit on ahead of schedule. So I'm just wondering if it's an opportunity to bring in Carrie Lewis, who's our illustrator. Carrie, are you there and are you able to share anything that you've captured today? Wow, look at that. That looks amazing. I think I'm here. <laughs> Carrie, would you like to just take us I through? I don't know if we can spotlight. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's brilliant. Excellent. Are you able to just point so, out what um, you've captured? Just... Yeah, definitely. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So um, what you've been talking about is this idea of co-production and it being everybody's business. It's right there at the top. Um, it's one of the biggest tools of recovery. Um, and so many people have started to say the impact that it's having on their lives and the positive changes that are happening that didn't happen historically. Um, that people are able to be in control and be independent within their own supports and recovery, which is really nice. Um, you've talked about some of the things that it means to you. And we've talked from a service perspective. We've also talked from a humanistic perspective. So the service bit is the strengths based. It's about valuing the lived experience and seeing that experience as an asset and as a tool for further planning and design. In terms of the humanization part of it, it's a chance for people to work together, to collaborate, to really learn and, and really make sure that there's equality there for people. It's a real way of working in a different way. Um, there has to be some really good feedback and this is how you can champion things. Um, and it's, it's kind of a backdoor champion that you're talking about here. So it's about the impression that you make as a social worker can be that champion point working with families in adults and children's services, um, supporting your colleagues to understand it and get them on board with everything. It really supports um, people's dignity, both from the social worker point of view and from the person who is receiving the support. Which leads into some of the benefits, and I really am touching the surface here. I'm only hitting that tip of the iceberg, and you know that there's a huge amount of more that comes in with this. And I'll pat this out as the morning goes on. But this greater understanding of people's experiences provides a huge influence on services provided. It provides what people need. It allows for improvements and a design for those in care and really creating a positive, inspired workforce. And when you bring all of this together, the power that it holds is actually huge. And just at that last little section, we're not, um, uh, we're acknowledging, should I say, that it's not always easy. And I've got it up in that tight right, right corner, but it's so worth the effort. Co-production really changes people's lives for the better. Okay. Wow, Carrie, that's fabulous. And what a perfect note to end on. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to You're Sarah, welcome. to everyone who's contributed to today's session and for everyone who's attended. Um, we would appreciate if you could take time to complete a brief survey, which I think might be added to the chat. And we'd welcome your thoughts and feedbacks you may have through our post event survey or by emailing socialworkweek at socialworkengland.org.uk. Just a reminder for those of you who may be registered social workers, reflecting on this session can be used as part of your CPD. You could also reflect on what you've learnt with a colleague, your manager or another professional. This would meet the requirement to reflect with a peer. Thank you so much everybody for attending today. What a brilliant update, what a brilliant session to open Social Work Week. Please remember we've got lots more events going on across the week, um, both that Social Work England are hosting and also that are being facilitated through our independent programme. If you, there's still opportunity to sign up to some of these events, so please go to our website where you'll find more details. In the meantime, take care and thanks very much everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.